This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Here is another Beyond the Big Screen teaser for episodes coming soon. I hope you enjoy and definitely tune in for the full episodes. If you want to learn more, you can head over to beyondthebigscreen.com. You can support Beyond the Big Screen on Patreon and Subscribestar. By joining on Patreon and or Subscribestar, you can help keep Beyond the Big Screen going and get many great benefits. Benefits include advertisement-free content, bonus content, and early access. The bonus content is great, too. I will feature outtakes from episodes and live streaming episodes. If you join at the executive producer level, you will become just that, an executive producer of Beyond the Big Screen. You will be able to develop ideas for upcoming episodes, help find great guests, and of course, have your name mentioned at the beginning or end of each episode. You won't just be a supporter, you will be a critical member of the team. Go over to patreon.com forward slash beyond the big screen or subscribestar.com forward slash beyond the big screen to learn more. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com, or follow us on social media by searching for A2Z History. I will see you next time. Beyond the big screen. Somebody who I don't believe was portrayed in the film, but another person in the house, Wojciech Frykowski, someone who had survived the Warsaw ghettos back in World War II, fought back and tried to flee, but was overcome by Watson and Krenwinkel, and also stabbed. Abigail Folger also tried to escape, but she was chased down by Krenwinkel and stabbed as well. Then, as um, we see in the movie, Tex Watson was told that he was told by Charles Manson to, quote-unquote, make it witchy. They made the scene witchy and just made an incredibly uh, chaotic scene, and then they left. Linda Kasabian drove them away from the house and they disposed of all the weapons and clothing uh, before they had gone back home, you might say, to the Spahn Ranch. Charles Manson was very angry following the news reports of this messy murder scene. And that's why the next night when the LaBiancas were murdered, Charles Manson showed up. Charles Manson wanted to show the family how to do this. He subdued the victim's and tied them up, but then he laughed. There were strong pro-war parts within American society. I mean, they may have been of the older generation, the World War II generation or the silent generation, but even among baby boomers, there were probably people who were pro-military Part of why John Wayne wanted to make this movie is he was virulently anti-communist, and he had the Johnson administration's explicit blessing. Now, the Johnson administration probably knew things that the public didn't know at this point, so they wanted to do whatever they could to put a positive spin on this. Um, so that's sort of the kind of the what's going on behind the scenes here that can at least make some more sense of it, because if you watch clips of this on YouTube, it, it looks very hokey compared to how contemporary movies are done. But um, so I think that is the valid criticism that John Wayne is just swapping out stock figures that he would use in his Westerns or his World War Two movies. And he'll he'll make statements where this is another John Wayne characteristic where he's not really speaking to someone. He looks off into the middle distance and it's as if he's speaking with destiny or fate itself. And <laughs> One of the lines in there, and I think this got a criticism from Roger Ebert and many others, is the only due process out here is a bullet, which, um, nah, I don't know, John Wayne. Like, I get that war is hell, but we also have the Geneva Convention and war crimes, tr- crimes tribunals, and maybe that's him trying to, like, put the hippie idealist journalist in his place and let him know that with guerrilla warfare, things are...